Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're continuing on with the Evidence for Evolution series. This time we're going to take a look at embryology. But before we begin, just a clarification. This series is supposed to be educational. I will not be making reference to creationist arguments throughout this series as it is not a response to creationism. If you want to see me directly deal with creationist arguments, that happens on Fridays, Thursdays for patrons. Part of the purpose of this series is for me to use as a reference when I am dealing with creationism, so when I say that there is evidence contained in Embryology for Evolution, rather than hunt down all the papers again, I could just point to this video. It is also meant to be approachable to the people that do hold the creationist viewpoint. It is somewhere they can come to see why people think evolution is true without having to tolerate a direct attack on their belief system. I am not actively trying to change anyone's position with this series, it's just laying out the evidence that we have in a way that is hopefully easy to understand. So let's go! Embryology is the study of the prenatal development of an organism, and can encompass everything from the production of gametes to a fully-fledged ready-to-be-born or hatched fetus. The evidence for evolution found in embryology is often along the same lines as the evidence found in homology, to the point that while making my homology video, I found it incredibly difficult not to use embryological examples, as I knew that embryology would be a different topic by itself. In fact, one of the ways we can tell if a structure is homologous is to trace its embryological development. A truly homologous structure will originate in the same place of the embryo, while an analogous one may not. Embryology is an interesting field because we can almost see the actual evolutionary development of an organism in the stages of the embryo. Not a perfect reenactment of evolutionary history like Ernst Haeckel proposed with recapitulation theory, but it holds true that the more closely related two organisms are, the more similar their embryological development will be, regardless of how similar their adult forms are. And as with homology, there is more to the similarities than a simple superficial resemblance. So let's start off with the gill slits. This is one of the easiest examples, as it is quite obvious just by looking at the different vertebrate embryos that they all have the same structure on the neck area that look remarkably like the structures that turn into the gill arches of fish. But the similarities go deeper than just a superficial resemblance. For instance, the structures originate from neural crest cells in the embryo. Neural crest cells are cells that form in the embryo just after the neural tube forms. In the embryo at this stage, there are essentially three layers of cells, the germ layers, with the top layer being the ectoderm, the middle layer being the mesoderm, and the bottom layer being the endoderm. The neural tube is formed when the ectoderm basically folds in on itself, and the neural crest cells are the ones that are on top of this fold, but just under the surface. I tell you this because we can trace individual cell histories and see exactly which area each structure originates from in the embryo. This is important because most bones trace their origin to the mesoderm, but the jaw bones that come from the gill slits trace their origin to the neural crest cells. And the gill arches in jawless fish also trace their origin to the neural crest cells. The odds of two unrelated features sharing an origin path throughout embryological development are extremely low, especially when we consider that the non-fish version turns into a structure, namely bone, that normally has its origins elsewhere. There is also the fact that the musculature of the vertebrate jaw appears to be homologous to the musculature of basal gills. And then there's the upper portion of the second arch, which turns into a structure called the hyomandibular bone in jawed fish, which acts as a support for the skull. A similar structure is found in modern reptiles, which not only helps to support the skull, but is pretty good at conducting sounds and has become part of the reptilian auditory system. And it originates from the same place on the second arch. The stirrup bones in the mammalian middle ear also originate from the upper portion of the second arch, but it no longer does any work in supporting the skull. As terrestrial vertebrates spent more time out of water, their cranium became more firmly attached to the rest of the skull, and thus no longer needed the support of the hyomandibular bone. But by the time this had happened, it had already started acting as a sound transducer, so its secondary function then became its primary function over evolutionary time, and it became the stirrup bone. And what's more, we find evidence that the ancestors of mammals diverged from the ancestors of birds and modern reptiles before the jaws developed the articulation that we see today. We can tell because the quadrate and articular bone in amphibians, reptiles, and birds all developed from the same part of the cartilage of the first embryonic arch. These are the bones that are responsible for the articulation of their jaws. But in mammals, the articulation happens in the dentary and squamosal bones, which develop from a slightly different section of the embryonic arches. This allows the bony elements that become part of the jaw in reptiles, amphibians, and birds to develop into the bones of the middle ear, with the quadrate becoming the incus bone and the articular bone becoming the malleus. 
By tracing the developments of these bones through the embryo, we can see that the posterior lower jawbones of reptiles, the gill arches of jawless fish, and the middle ear bones of mammals are all homologous in that they share their origin in the embryonic gill arches. And we can tell how closely related different animals are by tracing these structures' development through the embryonic stages. So now let's take a look at snakes. Snakes, despite not having any limbs, are tetrapods, which literally means four-footed. So why would we call them tetrapods? Well, it's because we know they are descended from tetrapods. How do we know? Well, one of the ways we know is that the embryos of some types of snake start to develop legs in the first 24 hours, complete with rudimentary leg bones like the femur, tibia, and fibula. But they don't make it far enough into differentiation to actually become cartilage, much less bone, so they end up degenerating. There are even more leftovers of the evolutionary process found in embryology. One of my favorite examples is the blowhole of the dolphin. As an early fetus, the dolphin has its nostrils on the front of its face, matching up with all the rest of the mammals. But as the fetus develops, the nostrils slowly migrate back to the top of the head. And these dolphins, with their nostrils, still have gill slits. And the gill slits in these dolphins still develop into ear bones, and which arch develops into which bone matches up with what would be expected of mammals. But there are several adaptations that are specific to hearing in the water, like the fat pad. And the dolphins still have evidence of hind limbs in their embryonic stages, despite not having any sign of external hind limbs. Unlike the snake limbs, though, the dolphin's hind limbs turn into a rudimentary pelvis, which still serves the function of anchoring some of the muscles associated with mating. Evolution has a way of taking old, defunct bits and finding new purposes for them. And that makes sense, because evolution does not have a plan for the future, it just works, through natural selection, with the variation in what is currently available. We can also bring this back to the tetrapod forelimb. Remember how we all have a humerus connected to the radius and ulna, connected to the carpals, then to the metacarpals, and then the phalanges? Well, as it turns out, one of the features that makes a tetrapod a tetrapod is that it has five digits. But looking at some of the tetrapods, we don't see five digits. I mean, we even categorize some of them by how many toes they have. Being an odd-toed ungulate myself, I am well aware of this fact. But when we look at the embryo, all tetrapod embryos go through a stage where they develop limbs with five digits, with the exception of the snakes whose limbs are reabsorbed before becoming prominent enough to count fingers. These digits will sometimes fuse together into slightly different structures, but they always start with five. This is also another way we can tell that the tetrapod forelimbs are homologous rather than just having a superficially similar appearance. Remember how we can trace the formation of the structures in the body all the way back through embryonic development? All the bones in the forelimb share the developmental path. They all originate within the same areas of the embryo. There is no reason at all that all tetrapods should start with five digits. There is no inherent advantage or disadvantage to it. There's no reason it should be 5 rather than 6, or 4, or 12. But it is 5, because evolution has no plan. When the first tetrapods evolved, for whatever reason, the ones with 5 digits on their limbs were the ones that were successful. So now all tetrapods start with 5 digits, even if one would have been better, like horses. Or three, like in birds and rhinos. Evolution works with what it has been given by past evolution. The successful tetrapod ancestor had five digits, so its descendants all have five digits. In environments where fewer digits were advantageous, it is easier to select for the fusing of digits, which is a fairly common mutation, rather than going back and redesigning from scratch. How would evolution redesign from scratch anyway? It would have to be a massive series of serendipitous mutations all happening within extremely short periods of time, like we're talking one or two generations, which I suppose is technically possible, but it is incredibly unlikely. What is likely is that fairly minor changes in existing structures could be useful in a new environment, and the fusing together of the digits is a common enough mutation that it is completely unsurprising that in some environments it was useful enough to stick around. Heading back into the ocean, we have baleen whales. Baleen whales have evolved from ancestral whales that had teeth. There is a decent, if a bit spotty, record for the evolution of the baleen. It looks as though the whales lost their teeth first, becoming suction feeders, much like the modern beaked whale, which has neither teeth nor baleen, with the baleen being a later development. We can tell through examining them and through the fossil record that baleen and teeth are not homologous. That is, baleen are not simply specialized teeth. They are an unrelated structure. But if we look at the embryos of modern baleen whales, before the baleen even develop, Teeth are formed beneath their gums, and are then reabsorbed. 
there is no reason for these teeth to develop. They never even make it out of the gums. They don't turn into anything else. They aren't useful. They just form and then disappear. The only reason baleen whale embryos should have teeth is if they evolved from a tooth whale that lost the ability to make teeth. It is possible that the reason they haven't completely lost their teeth yet is because the baleen might develop through a similar genetic pathway as the teeth. This makes sense because the teeth continue to grow well into mid-gestation, which seems like a really big resource drain that would be selected against during the millions of years of evolution since the baleens first developed. But if the baleen production uses proteins that are coded for by the genes that make the teeth, then this perfectly explains why the beginnings of teeth continue to linger despite their apparent uselessness. We can also look at the muscle structure of the human embryo for evidence. Human embryos have more muscles than adult humans have. Some of the muscles disappear completely, similar to the teeth of the baleen whales. Others fuse into different muscles. But we can look at these muscles and see homology between human embryos and other species. For instance, human embryos have a muscle in their forearm, the epitrochlear anconius, which can also be found in adult chimps. In most cases, this muscle disappears before birth, but some people can retain this muscle into adulthood. The same is true of the dorsometacarpalus muscle, which is found in modern lizards, but not found in mammals, except for fairly rare atavistic cases. An atavism is when a vestigial form has been lost in a species but makes a reappearance through a mutation. These muscles are still found in human embryos, developing in the exact same way as they do in lizard embryos. In embryology, embryo formation tends to be conserved. Structures can be found in embryos that are completely absent in adults. Sometimes these structures diversify in different ways in different organisms, such as the gill slits turning into gill arches, jaw bones, and ear bones. Also the tetrapod limbs starting with five digits but diverging as the embryo grows into single-toed hooves, three-toed hooves, three-fingered birds, etc. Other structures do their best to disappear completely, but still stick around despite being a pain in the butt, literally in the case of the coccyx. There is no reason for embryos to go through the motion of forming body parts that don't end up developing unless they are leftover remnants from an evolutionary ancestor. Horses don't need five digits in the embryonic stage, they just need the one that they end up with. Baleen whales don't need embryonic teeth, but they have them for a while. And sometimes it's a good thing that these structures stick around. Had the hyomandibular bone just gone away when we stopped needing it as a support for the skull, then we wouldn't have the ability to hear like we do today. It's possible, probably even, that it would have evolved in a different way, as hearing is a very useful feature. After all, hearing has evolved independently at least a couple of times. But evolution took a bone that we didn't need anymore, but happened to be good at transmitting sound, and adapted it into a bone that specializes in hearing. Of course, I am speaking anthropomorphically here, projecting intent on an unintentional process, but that just makes it easier to wrap our heads around. So that's it for today. Join me next week as we take a look at vestigial structures.